Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rovul. I work as a lecturer of pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is on leukemia part 1. In this lecture, we will learn about introduction and definition of leukemia, its classification, what do we mean by acute leukemia, what are its predisposing factors, and in this lecture we will mainly focus on acute myeloid leukemia and therefore we will talk about the classifications of acute myeloid leukemia, its pathogenesis, clinical features, lab diagnosis and towards the end of today's video we will also talk briefly about the treatments of acute myeloid leukemia. Then in the subsequent lectures of this series we will also talk about the other types of leukemia and I will also make an additional lecture on leukemoid reaction. Okay, a lot of topics so let's begin. Now my students often get very confused with the term leukemia and the term lymphoma. So let's clarify these two terms in the beginning of today's lecture. Now as you can see in the past the term leukemia and lymphoma were considered distinct entities. However, with increased understanding the divisions have now blurred. So what do we mean by leukemia? The term leukemia is used for neoplasms that present with widespread involvement of the bone marrow and usually but not always the peripheral blood is also involved. So always remember that in leukemia it is a neoplasm that has widespread involvement of the bone marrow. On the other hand, the term lymphoma is used for lymphoid proliferation that arise as discrete tissue masses. However, as we will see, in many cases, lymphomas may show features of leukemia and similarly, many leukemias may present with features of lymphoma. So the point that I am trying to make here is that although in the past the term leukemia and lymphoma were considered distinct entities with increased understanding the divisions have now blurred and now these two terms merely reflect the usual tissue distribution of each disease at the time of presentation. Now, before telling you the definition of leukemia, I would like to show you one more slide that is denoting the disorders of white blood cells. So, as we can see, disorders of white blood cells are first subdivided under two broad headings. They are proliferative disorders and leukopenia. Now, we all know that in proliferative disorders, the numbers of white blood cells are increased and in leukopenia the numbers of white blood cells are reduced and we can also see that the proliferative disorders of white blood cells are further subdivided into reactive proliferative disorders and neoplastic proliferative disorders. Reactive proliferative disorders are again divided into leukocytosis and leukomoid reaction and neoplastic proliferative disorders are divided into lymphoid neoplasms, myeloid neoplasms and histiocytic neoplasms. So what are the lymphoid neoplasms? They will include leukemias and lymphomas of B, T and natural killer cell origin. This group is divided into precursor B cell neoplasms, peripheral B cell neoplasms, precursor T-cell neoplasms, peripheral T-cell neoplasms, and Hodgkin's disease. Myeloid neoplasms will include acute myeloid leukemias, myelodysplastic syndrome, and chronic myeloproliferative 
disorders. So now that we have talked about some introductory points regarding leukemia, now we are ready to define leukemia. And this definition is very important both for your written and oral examination. So how can we define leukemia? Leukemias are diseases in which abnormal proliferation of hemopoietic cells causes progressively increasing infiltration of the bone marrow, although in certain forms the lymphatic tissues are particularly affected. Okay, so I am repeating this definition one more time for my students and then I will explain this definition. So let's say it together. How can we define leukemia? As written in your textbook, leukemias are diseases in which abnormal proliferation of hemopoietic cells causes progressively increasing infiltration of the bone marrow, although in certain forms the lymphatic tissues are particularly affected. Now let's explain this definition. So in the first line we can see that leukemias are diseases in which there is abnormal proliferation of hemopoietic cells. Now, what do we mean by hemopoietic cells? These are the stem cells and progenitor cells from which we get the mature blood cells. And in an adult individual, they are located in the bone marrow. So we can think of the hemopoietic cells as the grandfathers of the mature blood cells, right? So what is happening in leukemia? There is abnormal proliferation of those hemopoietic cells and they are infiltrating the bone marrow. And in certain forms, the lymphatic tissues are particularly affected as well. So what do we mean by leukemoid reaction? Now I will make a separate video entirely on leukemoid reaction, but for the moment just remember that leukemoid reactions are defined as reactive excessive leukocytosis in which peripheral blood resembles leukemia but the subject does not have leukemia. So in simple sentence always remember that leukemoid reaction is happening when the peripheral blood picture is resembling that of leukemia so there is high number of white blood cells in the peripheral blood film. However, when we are studying the bone marrow of that individual, we will find out that that person doesn't have leukemia. The bone marrow findings will not be that of leukemia. And the clinical features of leukemia such as enlargement of the spleen, enlargement of lymph node, and hemorrhages are usually absent in leukemoid reaction. So now that we have defined leukemia and leukemoid reaction, now let's move on and talk about the classification of leukemias. Now, historically, leukemias have been classified on the basis of cell types predominantly involved into myeloid and lymphoid leukemias, and also on the basis of natural history of the disease into acute and chronic leukemias. Therefore, we are getting four types. They are acute myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoid leukemia, chronic myeloid leukemia, and chronic lymphoid leukemia. Now, acute myeloid leukemia is also called acute myeloblastic leukemia. Acute lymphoid leukemia is also called acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Chronic myeloid leukemia is called chronic myelocytic leukemia and chronic lymphoid leukemia is also called chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Now, can you see a pattern here? Whenever we were talking about acute leukemias, we used the term blast in the nomenclature. For example, acute myeloblastic leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. However, when we were talking about chronic leukemias, we did not use the term blast 
in their nomenclature. And this is very significant because, as we will see, in acute leukemias, there is block in the differentiation and, as a result, we will see that the predominant cells are undifferentiated blast cells. That's why we can use the term blast in their nomenclature. So, now let's talk about acute leukemia, normally defined as presence of over 20% of blast cells in the bone marrow at clinical presentation. So, we will define a leukemia as acute leukemia when there is presence of over 20% of blast cells in the bone marrow at clinical presentation. However, it can be also diagnosed with less than 20% blasts if specific leukemia-associated cytogenetic or molecular genetic abnormalities are present. We can define the lineage of blast cells by microscopical examinations to see their morphology and we can also use immunophenotypic, cytogenetic and molecular analysis to define the lineage of blast cells as well. Now always remember acute leukemias are usually aggressive disease, malignant transformation occur in hemopoietic stem cells which are called blasts or in their early progenitor cells. Genetic damage involves key biochemical steps. Genetic damage causes increased rate of proliferation, reduced apoptosis, block in cellular differentiation, and all these things lead to accelerated growth of undifferentiated blast cells. And if untreated, acute leukemias are usually rapidly fatal. However, with modern treatments, most younger patients are ultimately cured of their disease. Now this image is summarizing how acute leukemias develop following genetic damage. So at the center we can see a stem cell or a blast cell and apoptosis and differentiation of the cell has been blocked. However, self-renewal is maintained or increased and proliferation is also increased. All these things are leading to accumulation of undifferentiated cells and that is the basic mechanism of acute leukemias. So now that we have talked about the basic mechanisms of acute leukemias, now let's move on and talk about the predisposing factors of acute leukemia. Now we can broadly divide the predisposing factors of acute leukemia under two broad headings. They are hereditary factors and acquired factors. Among acquired factors, there are ionizing radiation, chemical agents, viruses, acquired conditions and influence of age and sex. So now let's talk about these various factors one by one. Regarding hereditary factors, always remember that evidence suggests that there is role of family history, occurrence in identical twins and predisposition of these leukemias in certain genetic syndromes. For example, families with high incidence of leukemia have been identified. Similarly, High concordance rate is seen among identical twins if acute leukemia develops in the first year of life. That means in case of identical twins, if one of them develops acute leukemia in the first year of life, the other twin has high concordance rate of developing acute leukemia as well. This list is also very important. As we have seen, certain genetic diseases are associated with leukemia. For example, in Down syndrome, there is 20 times increased incidence of leukemia. Other important genetic diseases that are associated with leukemia will include Bloom syndrome, Kleinfelter syndrome, Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome, 
Fanconi's anemia, ataxia, telangiectasia, etc. Now I have four separate videos entirely on Down syndrome and Klinefelter syndrome. So you can also watch those videos after finishing this video to know more about Down syndrome and Klinefelter syndrome. Regarding accurate factors, first let's talk about ionizing radiation and we know that individuals can be exposed to ionizing radiation following nuclear fallout, therapeutic irradiation and diagnostic x-ray and ionizing radiation is a very important accurate factor that can lead to leukemia. The next accurate factor that we will talk about is chemical agents. Occupational exposure to benzene has been associated with increased risk of acute myeloid leukemia as well as with aplastic anemia. Alkylating agents that are used for chemotherapy of cancer may induce acute myeloid leukemia. Such secondary leukemias develop about five to six years after chemotherapy and are usually preceded by myelodysplastic syndrome and treatment with certain drugs that inhibit topoisomerase 2 are also associated with acute myeloid leukemias. Regarding viruses, always remember that although the role of oncogenic viruses are not well established in development of leukemia, there is one exception and that is human T lymphotropic virus type 1 and this particular virus is associated with development of adult T-cell leukemia lymphoma. Moving on to the next factor and that was some accurate conditions. Some accurate conditions may predispose to acute leukemia. They will include myeloproliferative disorders, myelodysplastic syndromes, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria and aplastic anemia and whenever you mention this term myeloid proliferative disorders the examiners are very fond of asking you name some common myeloid proliferative disorders and then the answer will be chronic myeloid leukemia polycythemia vera and myelofibrosis regarding influence of age and sex always remember that acute lymphoblastic leukemia is most common form of leukemia in children. Acute myeloid leukemia is the predominant form of leukemia in adults, adolescents and infants. Acute myeloid leukemia has equal sex incidence. However, acute lymphoblastic leukemia has slightly higher incidence in males compared to females. So now that we have talked about the predisposing factors of acute leukemia, now we will focus our attention to acute myeloid leukemia. And throughout the next part of this lecture, we will mainly talk about this particular type of leukemia. So how can we define acute myeloid leukemia? It is a tumor of hemopoietic progenitors caused by acquired oncogenic mutations that impede differentiation leading to accumulation of immature myeloid blasts in the bone marrow. So I am repeating this definition one more time. Acute myeloid leukemia is a tumor of hematopoietic progenitors caused by acquired oncogenic mutations that impede differentiation leading to accumulation of immature myeloid blasts in the bone marrow and if you had seen the image that I had shown you a few slides ago you will find this definition very easy so in this case in acute myeloid leukemia there is blockage in the differentiation as well as in apoptosis and as a result there is accumulation of undifferentiated or immature blast cells of myeloid series in the bone marrow and that is leading to acute myeloid leukemia. Regarding its incidence, always remember it is the most common form of acute leukemia 
in adults, the incidence rises throughout life, peak incidence after 60 years. And whenever we say that it is the most common form of acute leukemia in adults, sometimes the examiners may try to puzzle you and they may ask you some tricky questions. For example, they may ask you, can it develop in childhood? And always remember that although this is the most common form of acute leukemia in adults, a minor fraction of this leukemia can also be seen in childhood. So that is written in the last bullet point. It forms only a minor fraction that is 10 to 15 percent of leukemias in childhood. So now that we have defined acute myeloid leukemia, now we will move on and talk about the classification of acute myeloid leukemia. Currently two main classification schemes are followed. One is the French, American, British or FAB classification and the other classification is World Health Organization classification of acute myeloid leukemia. Depending upon available laboratory facilities, both of these classification schemes for acute myeloid leukemia are followed in different settings. Now the WHO classification is the newer classification and there are some differences between the WHO and FAB classification of acute myeloid leukemia. For example, the French, American, British or FAB classification is based on morphology and cytochemistry and in this classification a leukemia is considered acute if the bone marrow consists of more than 30% blast cells. On the other hand, the WHO classification of acute myeloid leukemia is relied on clinical cytogenetic and molecular abnormalities and there is limited reliance on blast cell morphology and cytochemistry. And here the cutoff percentage of marrow blast is also revised and lowered to 20% from 30%. So in WHO classification a leukemia is considered acute if the bone marrow consists of more than 20% blast cells instead of 30 percent blasts. So now let's talk about these classifications one by one and we will start by talking about the FAB classification or French American British classification of acute leukemia. As we can see we can classify both acute lymphoblastic leukemia and acute myeloblastic leukemia in this classification, but as I will make a separate video entirely on acute lymphoblastic leukemia, so we won't talk much about that in this lecture. For the moment, just remember that in FAB classification, acute lymphoblastic leukemia will have three types. They are L1, L2, and L3. Moving on to acute myeloid leukemia or acute myeloblastic leukemia, we can classify that from M0 to M7 in FAB classification. M0 is acute myeloblastic leukemia, minimally differentiated. M1 is acute myeloblastic leukemia without maturation. M2 is with maturation. And M3 is very important. It is hypergranular promyelocytic leukemia and M4 is acute myelomonocytic leukemia, M5 is acute monocytic leukemia and M6 is acute erythroleukemia and M7 is acute megakaryocytic leukemia. Now moving on to the WHO classification or World Health Organization classification of acute myeloid leukemia, we can see that in this classification we can divide acute myeloid leukemia in four groups. They are 
acute myeloid leukemia with recurrent genetic aberrations. The second group is acute myeloid leukemia with myelodysplastic syndrome like features. The third group is acute myeloid leukemia therapy related. And the fourth group is acute myeloid leukemia not otherwise specified. So in this slide, we can see some acute myeloid leukemias with genetic aberrations. They will include acute myeloid leukemia with translocation between chromosome 8 and 21. Another one is acute myeloid leukemia with inversion of chromosome 16. Another example is acute myeloid leukemia with translocation between chromosome 15 and 17 and so on. And in all these cases, we can see that due to such translocation or due to such inversion, there is formation of fusion gene and that is causing the problem. For example, in this slide, first we are talking about acute myeloid leukemia with translocation between chromosome 8 and 21 and also about acute myeloid leukemia with inversion of chromosome 16. Now, when there is translocation between chromosome 8 and 21, there is gene rearrangement that is disrupting the RUNX1 gene. Similarly, when there is inversion of chromosome 16, there is disruption in a gene called CBFB. Now, under normal condition, the RUNX1 gene and CBFB gene encode polypeptides that bind one another to form RUNX1 CBF1 beta transcription factor that is needed for normal hematopoiesis. However, when there is translocation between chromosome 8 and 21, or whenever there is inversion of chromosome 16, that will create some fusion genes or chimeric genes that will encode fusion proteins, and those fusion proteins will interfere with the normal function and they will block maturation of myeloid cells, and that will lead to formation of acute leukemia. Similarly, when there is translocation between chromosomes 15 and 17, that leads to fusion of gene for retinoic acid receptor alpha that is located on chromosome 15 with promyelocytic leukemia gene that is located on chromosome 17. Such fusion gene will result in formation of fusion protein that favors recruitment of transcriptional repressors. This will result in blockage in differentiation at promyelocytic stage, and this can be overcome by treatment with either all trans retinoic acid or arsenic trioxide. The second group in WHO classification of acute myeloid leukemia is acute myeloid leukemia with myelodysplastic syndrome-like features. This group will include acute myeloid leukemia with prior myelodysplastic syndrome, acute myeloid leukemia with multilineage dysplasia, and acute myeloid leukemia with myelodysplastic syndrome like cytogenetic aberrations. The third group is acute myeloid leukemia therapy related. And the most important thing that you have to remember regarding this group is that it has very poor prognosis. Now, the fourth group in WHO classification is acute myeloid leukemia, not otherwise specified. And as you can see, this group has similarity with the previously discussed FAB classification. So this group will include acute myeloid leukemia, minimally differentiated, without maturation, with myelocytic maturation, with myelomonocytic maturation, with monocytic maturation, with erythroid maturation, and acute myeloid leukemia with megakaryocytic maturation. So now that we have discussed 
the classifications of acute myeloid leukemia. Now let's move on and briefly talk about the pathogenesis. So as we can see, recurrent genetic aberrations that are seen in acute myeloid leukemia disrupt genes encoding transcription factor. And normally those transcription factors are required for normal myeloid differentiation. So when there is recurrent genetic aberrations, those normal myeloid cell differentiations will not take place. And as a result, we will have undifferentiated or blast cells of the myeloid series that will lead to development of acute myeloid leukemia. Another mechanism is mutations that lead to activation of growth factor signaling pathways, collaborate with transcription factor aberration, and all these things produce acute myeloid leukemia. So now that we have briefly discussed the pathogenesis of acute myeloid leukemia, now let's move on and talk about the clinical features. As we can see, Clinical features of acute myeloid leukemia can be divided into two groups. The first group is clinical features due to bone marrow failure, and the second group is clinical features due to organ infiltration. So let's discuss these features one by one. Regarding clinical features that are due to bone marrow failure, the first clinical feature is obvious. There will be anemia, and that will cause paler, lethargy, and dyspnea. There will be also bleeding manifestations due to thrombocytopenia, and that may produce spontaneous bruises, petechi, gum bleeding, and also other bleeding tendencies. As there is reduction in the normal white blood cell count, recall that the leukemic cells are abnormal and they are undifferentiated and blast cells, so they are not normal. So since the normal functioning cells have reduced an abnormal amount of blast cells are seen in the leukemic patient, infections will be very common. Infections of the mouth, throat, skin, respiratory, perianal, and other sites are common. Fever is generally attributed to infections in acute leukemia. Sometimes no obvious source of infection can be found and fever may occur in the absence of infection. Moving on to clinical features that are due to organ infiltration. There will be pain and tenderness of the bones, for example, sternal tenderness due to bone infarcts and also due to subperiosteal infiltration of leukemic cells. There may be lymphadenopathy, that is enlargement of the lymph nodes, and there may be also enlargement of the tonsils. Splenomegaly, that is enlargement of the spleen, may occur. A splenic infarction, subcapsular hemorrhages, and splenic ruptures may also occur. Similarly, enlargement of the liver or hepatomegaly is frequently present due to leukemic infiltration. However, always remember that such infiltrates usually do not interfere with liver function. Leukemic infiltrations may also occur in the kidney. However, they also usually does not interfere with renal function. Now, leukemic cells may also infiltrate the gingiva and that may result in gum hypertrophy and this is a frequent finding in myelomonocytic or M4 and monocytic or M5 leukemias. Now, another very important clinical feature, particularly for your examination, is chloroma. Now, what do we mean by chloroma? It is a localized tumor-forming mass occurring in the skin or orbit due to local infiltration of those tissues by leukemic cells. It is also known as granulocytic sarcoma or myeloid sarcoma. And in the last bullet point, we can see that rarely testis may also be infiltrated by leukemic cells and that will cause testicular myeloid sarcoma.
So now that we have discussed the clinical features of acute myeloid leukemia, now let's move on and talk about the lab diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia. The diagnosis is made by a combination of routine blood picture and bone marrow examination, and these tests are accompanied with cytochemical stains and other special lab investigations. So, what will be the findings in the blood picture? Anemia is almost always present, and it is generally severe and progressive. The red blood cells will be normochromic, reticulocytosis may be seen up to 5%, and few nucleated cells may also be present. Platelet count is usually below 50,000 per microliter. Spontaneous bleeding episodes will develop in patients with platelet count less than 20,000 per microliter. Now, always remember, in acute promyelocytic leukemia, or M3, disseminated intravascular coagulation may occur. Now, I have a separate video entirely on disseminated intravascular coagulation, so you can also watch that video after finishing this video to know more about disseminated intravascular coagulation. Often, there is progressive increase in white blood cell count. In advanced cases, white blood cell count may exceed 100,000 per microliter. Majority of leukocytes in the peripheral blood are blasts. So in this picture, we can see the peripheral blood film finding of acute myeloid leukemia. So here is a myeloblast. We can see that it has four nucleoli, and one is marked with the black arrow. This is our rods, and these are red blood cells. Now, you may be asking me, Dr. Robiul, what do we mean by our rod? And always remember, these are elongated needle-shaped granular materials that are seen in the cytoplasm of myeloblasts, and they are seen particularly in M2, and M3, acute myeloid leukemias. Now, this slide is very important for your examination. Often the examiners may ask you, what are the differences between myeloblast and lymphoblast? So always remember, myeloblasts are larger compared to lymphoblasts. Both have round or oval nucleus. However, in myeloblast, the number of nucleoli is from 2 to 5, and in case of lymphoblast, the number of nucleoli is 1 to 2. The nuclear membrane is very fine in case of myeloblast, and in case of lymphoblast, the nuclear membrane is fairly dense. Nuclear chromatin is fine in myeloblast, and it is coarse in lymphoblast. Cytoplasm is moderate in myeloblast, and it is scanty in lymphoblast. Moving on to bone marrow examination, always remember typically in acute myeloid leukemia, the cellularity will be hypercellular. However, in certain cases, a dry tap may also occur. Now, what do we mean by dry tap? It is the failure to obtain bone marrow during an attempt of bone marrow aspiration. Dry tap may occur due to several causes. For example, it may occur in acute myeloid leukemia due to pancytopenia, and sometimes the bone marrow is so much packed with leukemic cells that they cannot be aspirated because those cells are enmeshed in reticulin fibers and they cannot be aspirated. And all these things may lead to dry tap. Now, regarding the leukemic cells, bone marrow is generally tightly packed with these leukemic blast cells. 20% myeloblast in the bone marrow is required for labeling the case as acute myeloid leukemia. Cytochemical stains may also be used as an adjunct to the Romanowski stain for determining 
the type of acute myeloid leukemia. Now, erythropoiesis is reduced. This erythropoiesis, ring sideroblasts, and megaloblastic features are also common. And regarding megakaryocytes, their number is usually reduced or they may be even absent. Now, we have seen that the WHO classification gives special importance on categorization of acute myeloid leukemia on the basis of cytogenetic abnormalities. Always remember, in 75% of the cases, chromosomal analysis of dividing leukemic cells in the bone marrow show karyotypic abnormalities which may be related to prognosis. Regarding immunophenotyping, always remember that the leukemic cells in acute myeloid leukemia express CD13 and CD33 antigens. Regarding cytochemistry, always remember that certain enzymes, fat, glycogen, or other substances are identified in blast cells by cytochemical techniques. For example, myeloperoxidase is positive in immature myeloid cells containing granules and overrods. Sudan black is positive in immature cells in acute myeloid leukemia. Periodic acid skiff is positive in erythroleukemia and nonspecific esterase is positive in monocytic series. So now that we have discussed the lab diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia, now we will move on and talk briefly about the treatment of acute myeloid leukemia. And as we can see, we can divide the treatment under two broad headings, general supportive therapy and specific therapy. Now, general supportive therapy will include insertion of central venous catheter, blood product support, prophylaxis and treatment of infections, etc. Regarding insertion of central venous catheter, always remember that it is done for patients who will need intensive treatment. It is done via a skin tunnel from chest into the superior vena cava. And this provides ease of access for administering chemotherapy antibiotics, blood products, and intravenous feeding. Regarding blood product support, we have to give red cell support when hemoglobin is less than 80 gram per liter. In patients needing both red cells and platelets, platelets are given first because that will reduce the risk of further fall in platelet count. Platelet transfusion is required when typically a platelet count is below 10 into 10 to the power 9 per liter. However, this should be doubled in the presence of active bleeding or infection. Fresh frozen plasma may be needed to reverse coagulation defects. Now, we know that patients of acute myeloid leukemias will be given chemotherapy, and chemotherapy will cause rapid lysis of tumor cells. And this may trigger acute rise in plasma uric acid, potassium, and phosphate, leading to tumor lysis syndrome. And how can we prevent such tumor lysis syndrome? We have to use allopurinol intravenous fluid and electrolyte replacement. Regarding treatment and prophylaxis of infection, always remember patients should be isolated and may be placed in laminar airflow room that will reduce exposure to airborne particles and pathogens. Bowel sterilization, topical antiseptics, systemic antibiotics, and leukocyte concentrates are also considered. Regarding specific therapy, these are determined according to age, performance status, and genetic lesions within the tumor. In younger patients, treatment is primarily with intensive chemotherapy, usually given in three or four blocks, and each block is of approximately one week. What are the commonly used drugs? 
for specific therapy of acute myeloid leukemia. They will include cytosine, arabinoside, downorubicin, idaurubicin, mitoxantrone, and etoposides are also used in various regimens. Stem cell transplant is offered in selected intermediate risk and high risk cases in first remission. However, stem cell transplant is not used for patients in the favorable risk group unless they have disease relapse. Reduced intensity conditioning regimens have raised the age at which patients may be considered for stem cell transplant. So this concludes our first lecture of leukemia series. I hope this video was helpful. If you like my videos, do comment, share, subscribe, and let me know. And for my students, I will also recommend you to go through your textbooks to know more. I will upload the second part of this series, hopefully within a week, where we will discuss about acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Okay, that's all for today. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.